This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Stay tuned to the end of the video for more information. Over a year ago, I put out my retrospective on the base game of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, one of my biggest and most in-depth videos to date. Later in October, I did the same for Hearts of Stone. Somehow it's come around very quickly, but it's time to close the book on The Witcher 3 for good with Blood and Wine. This video acts similarly to my Hearts of Stone video as an expansion to the original video and that of Hearts of Stone, continuing from where we left off. It'll be split up into chapters the same way the other two videos were for ease of navigation, starting from chapter 14 as chapter 13 is where we left off in Hearts of Stone. I'll link both of the previous videos in the description if you want to give them a watch, but this video can just as easily be watched on its own. Returning to where we left things on the edge of the cliffs at the Temple of Lilvani after finishing up things with Gaunter and Olgird, it was time to head out, off to a new adventure. Returning to this world felt like coming home once again. I felt the pure energy the game exuded, and I was more than ready to delve into another journey in this incredible universe. As I rode through the fields of Velen, off in search of where the wind would take me next, we begin Blood and Wine. Wolves asleep in midst the trees. To me, place always seemed straight out of a fairy tale. Knights errant, elven palaces. Did they send you after me? Who are they? What do you mean, they? But one so light, anxious, wide away. Detlaf is not some decadent shit who kills for sport, or to assuage a dryness of throat. Why should I trust you? Because the Duchess trusts me. Because I'm a freak, too. Because cases like yours are my bread and butter. Say I do decide to fight Detlaf. I want what I'm paying for. The head of the beast. Riding with Roach across the stormy fields of Velen, I enter the Stonecutter settlement known as Holloway to meet with the knights from Tucson. We find them speaking with the people of the town, people who demand they leave. However, the knights wish to help the town with a bandit problem, immediately showing the difference between Tucson and the more northern realms. Geralt explaining that if they take out the bandits, more will just fill the gap, maybe worse ones. Velen doesn't work the same as the duchy, it's rough and it's not friendly. The knights are both characters from the Witcher books, and Geralt references it being a long time since they last spoke. From here, we begin our descent into the mystery of the Beast of Beauclair, a mystery that lingers over the entire DLC and is riveting throughout. Most honourable Geralt, slayer of monsters and all Ifels nefarious, which prey on the defenceless of this world, whereas never have you been known to deny help to the innocent, nor leave widows and orphans to fates undeserved, answer you now our present summons. Free us from the beast which floods our streets with blood, and sows panic in the hearts of rich and poor alike. Come to our aid, Witcher. Thus humbly beseeches you the Star-Cross City's most gracious protectress, Her Illustrious Highness, Duchess Anna Henrietta. I want to hear more about this beast. Some kind of monster? Just guessing. Most assuredly, though no one has caught a good look at it as yet, our only sure witnesses, bodies massacred in a brutal, horrid manner. Look. Some sketches drafted from descriptions given by those who claim they glimpsed the beast. Each quite different. To my mind, these witnesses lie. How many victims so far? Two. When Her Grace learnt of the second, she discharged us immediately to fetch you, promising grants of land and fortunes in gold, should you answer her summons. An ill wind blows, Geralt. The beast cannot be tracked. Folks say it wields black magic. Uh, I sometimes think back to all the contracts I've ever taken from sovereigns. Can't name hardly any where I came out ahead. You cannot be thinking to refuse. Ah, uh, no. Just struck by a thought. How the Duchess can sometimes be... Mm, demanding. So you accept the contract? Excellent! We must set off at once. We long wanted this land searching for you. Yet time is of the essence. Ready to go, as soon as you're packed. Ah, then post haste to Tucson. To Tucson! 
The information is all laid out on the table from the start and instantly sparks all intrigue needed. It's time we headed to the south to do some. Toussaint, the land of love and wine. Exactly how I remembered it. You would find Beauclair has changed some these past years. Walk about when you have the chance. You will see for yourself. To me, place always seemed straight out of a fairy tale. Knights errant, elven palaces. You insinuate that we are somehow odd? The difference in vibe from Velen and Novigrad to that of Toussaint is just startling at first. The castles, the vast fields, the bright sun and the blue sky. Like Geralt said, this place is right out of a fairy tale. And immediately that difference draws you in. New lore to learn, new politics, new people and places. But not quite yet, as immediately we're forced into battle against a giant that is attacking a soldier in a local farm. Brandishing our sword, we lunge into battle against the beast. The fight is nothing too hard, but it's a great set piece to establish the DLC and get us into things again. Something as simple as a witcher fighting a monster is the one constant. Despite being in a new land with a million new things, we still have the same job to do. But this is nothing compared to our contract from the Duchess. The man here who was fighting the giant links to a later side story, one of my personal favourites. He was trying to impress a woman and that's why he was fighting the beast. Big beast. Tackling it single-handed? None too wise. Neither is love born of wisdom, Witcher. So, Guillaume, out with it. Which fair damsel inspired you to vow to kill that filth? The most beautiful among them. If he wishes to guard her name a secret, he need not reveal it. You I do not know, sir, nor seem you a knight, yet still I am profoundly grateful, nay, indebted to you for your succor. This trophy, sir, is yours. Moving on from this, we continue to follow Milton, who takes us to the site of the most recent victim of the beast, his corpse washed up in a river close to the local tavern the cockatrice. Investigating, we discover that his body has been moved recently. However, there are pieces of information we're able to discover from the site itself. Heading into the local tavern, we are able to question the locals on what they saw, which leads us to a few details. First of all, the law regarding this new region is beyond interesting. The way they conduct themselves and the politics is very, very different from that of Velen or Novigrad. It's a whole new world and one that reveals itself the more that you progress. Their priorities almost seem off, caring more about vineyards and such rather than wars or monsters. Having this luxury feels very unique from the areas we visited previously. And second of all, we notice a woman who left the inn, someone Geralt felt was important, but we don't yet know why. After discussing people's opinions of the royals and the beast itself, we leave the tavern to enter back into the world. Milton leaves us and we're now free in Toussaint to do as we wish. I left the building, out into the sun, walked to the notice board outside. The role-playing aspect of the Witcher is always the most fun. Being a Witcher on the path, taking contracts and defeating monsters. It's very basic, but it's always nailed to a T, and that aspect is one that I was very excited to get back to. And with those quests added into my log, I headed to Corvo Bianco to assess the corpse of the most recent victim of the beast. Arriving, you quickly notice the vineyard has been attacked. Many bodies laid dead and there is a trail of blood leading into the cellar. It's clear something's not right. With the mystery that has been laid and the eerie vibe in the air, it truly is terrifying entering the cellar. Not sure what you might find or what might attack you at any moment. The suspense is built up perfectly. We find, however, it's not the beast, but a Bruxer. Why, however, we aren't sure of just yet. I know what you are. Don't know why you killed these people, though. Clearly wasn't for their blood. We don't have to fight. You are wrong. I cannot let you leave. 
were launched into a fight against the Brooks, a crafty enemy, one which moves incredibly fast and uses invisibility to evade your detection, throwing Eden on the ground and using a quick lick of Vampire Royal Urge to make short work of them. Like a dance, I dodged her attacks and retaliated when appropriate to take her down at last. Finally, we're able to take a look at the body of the victim, discovering it was chopped up into pieces as well as having a pouch of coins placed in the throat. Shows that the beast is not so much a beast, it's sentient, uses logic. The bones have been sliced, which shows the beast had long, sharp claws. There's also a third hand, not belonging to the victim. So, murderer was clearly a monster, but not a Bruxa. But then why'd the Bruxa come here for the severed hand? And who does the hand belong to? Why the hell's it still warm? Now, how it shoved down the victim's throat, what's the significance? And why was he chopped up into pieces? Lots of questions, no answers so far. Need to know about the other victims. I'll ask Palmerin to get me in to see the Duchess. Lots of questions, and not a lot of answers. It's time to find Palmerin to take us to the Duchess. I immediately headed across the fields of Toussaint, which differ hugely from the previous locations. The luscious vineyards and countryside is just a joy to navigate, to meet up with Palmerin in hopes of meeting the Duchess herself to progress our search. There's a great moment here with some kids, one of which asks a question to Geralt. Is it true virtue always triumphs villainy? To which I chose the third option, and it felt incredibly fitting. Not always. Could go either way. Sometimes virtue wins, sometimes villainy gets the upper hand. Still worth being good. But why? If it doesn't mean you'll win. Palmer and Story, think back. A decent man attracts other good folk, makes friends he can count on. A rogue? Well, he can only count on other rogues. And who would you rather have for a friend? A man of virtue? I must agree. Now, that will do for questions. Go find your parents. It's something that feels very true to the themes of The Witcher. Before we see the Duchess, however, we must observe a tawny fight. Guillaume, the one that was fighting the giant from before, has to face a Shelmar, again to impress his beloved. As you can imagine, things go horribly wrong, and again, we're thrown into a fight with the Shelmar to save Guillaume. A fight where I thought Palmerin had fucking died. Thankfully, however, he didn't, and we're just catching some Zs. Once the fight is concluded, we finally are introduced to the Duchess of Tucson, Anna Henrietta. Geralt, we must talk. Vivian, you shall talk later in the medic's tent. Geralt, magnificent, breathtaking. Your grace. We knew that to summon you was a brilliant idea. We are delighted, raffish, to have struck upon it. And I'm truly uh, honored. See to our young hero. Hop, hop, for we must make off with Geralt. We should talk. We had been long awaiting your arrival, had nearly lost hope. Then suddenly, that entrance, so spectacular. Your Grace, my contract. I'd like to discuss it. Naturally, but not here. We shall need Damien. He let the investigation pending your arrival. But whatever could he be? Come, we must find him. Upon reaching Damien, there is an immediate sign that he and Geralt butt heads. He questions each of our conclusions and our decisions, doesn't trust us, and it's an interesting dynamic, as he's very loyal to his Duchess and to his state, as well as feeling bound to the five chivalric virtues of the Knights of Toussaint, which we find out about now, something intrinsically linked to the Beast's killings. As we discussed the previous victims in Crespi, Dulac, and Le Croix, we're able to come to the conclusion that the killer, whatever it is, is in fact using the chivalric virtues against the victims, taking down the Knights of Toussaint and pointing out the ironies of each man. Beast seems to be pointing up moral decay, denouncing it. Victims were all humiliated. Might have been murdered to emphasize their lack of specific chivalric virtues. Honor compromised by the pillory. Wisdom by ridicule. Generosity by a coin pouch shoved down a throat. It seems to fit true, though not perfectly. Can't discount the theory if it's on the lips of everyone in town. Say our reasoning's right. Next murder will be just as showy and denounce the victim's lack of the fourth virtue, valor. We can also assume that victim will be an elder knight. Let's think. At the moment, all the knights are either at the tourney grounds or in the palace gardens. Our annual hare hunts shall begin there shortly. 
Have you heard of the custom? Milton mentioned something. Seemed excited to prance around in a bunny costume. Not sure why. Hang on. Strange circumstances. A knight advanced in years. The famed cowardice of rabbits. Could it be that simple? Is Milton de Peyrac Peyren the next victim? Milton also knew Delacroix. Told me so down by the river. Damien! To miss something so obvious. De Peyrac Peyren, Crespi, Delacroix, and Delac formed a nightly team. It was years ago, but... Your Grace, we need to find Milton. Immediately. Rather problematic. You see, the garden entertainments are due to start, and he's disguised as the Hare, hiding somewhere, waiting for some tipsy courtiers to find him. The Hare's hiding place is a carefully guarded secret. We must call off the game, at once. First and foremost, we must remain calm. Damien, order the garden searched immediately, but discreetly. By no means can we disrupt the festivities. Panic will only incite the beast to strike sooner. And you, Witcher, follow me. My gardens, my night, I shall take the fall. A murder is out of the question. I will not allow it. Not near my palace. Horses? Ready our horses! And with the fourth victim discovered, we ready our horses and ride to the palace. We have to find Milton before it's too late. <laughs> There's a game being held at the palace, part of the festival. The participants must find a unicorn horn, a golden fish, and a phoenix egg. Finding all three will give them the location of the hare, which is being played by Milton himself. Splitting up with Anna, we go in search of the unicorn horn and the golden fish, whilst Anna tracks down the phoenix egg. This segment is implemented terrifically. The way The Witcher does its silly quests is always handled masterfully. Geralt doesn't just join in and become an idiot. The pace of the quest still holds despite the fact that you're doing a silly scavenger hunt to find a magical hair. Geralt thinks this whole thing is stupid. The seriousness of why you're doing it doesn't falter. It fits perfectly into this world, allows you through Geralt's eyes to see the world of Tucson as incredibly trivial, especially coming from a place like Velen. These nobles and royals playing this silly game all while you're trying to stop a murder. The contrast between the two ups the suspense even further. Finding both of the clues and meeting up again with Anna allows us to deduce the location of the hare. It's a greenhouse. Heading immediately there, we encounter the beast for the first time. Coming out of the wonderfully crafted mocap scene, we enter the warehouse where we meet with the beast face to face for the first time. Spence is high, as is our adrenaline. They hold back on revealing the beast very, very well. The best way to create suspense is to show restraint. Don't unveil your big mystery right away. Keep it hidden. And this also creates fear, something bigger than any monster we've faced before. This belonged to you, maybe? It did, but you may keep it. I've a new one. I do not know you. I've done you no harm. Yet first you butchered a Bruxer who was dear to me. Now you pursue me. Why? You've killed four innocent people, at least. And you? How many innocents have you cut down? Not here to talk about me. That line, how many innocents have you cut down, speaks once again to the themes of the Witcher series, choosing between lesser evils. You can't save them all. Sometimes you find yourself with innocent's blood on your hands. And what even counts as innocent? The amount of city guards that we've been forced to fight, or bandits who despite breaking the law only stole out of a need. It's worth thinking about, especially since this story goes a lot deeper than simply being a beast. Yet, that is exactly what we are doing. So. Did they send you after me? Who are they? What do you mean, they? Duchess hired me. You've been murdering her subjects. 
<laughs> Is it as simple as that? I would ask you to convey to the Duchess that I've but one victim left, but you'll not get the chance. We are immediately adding more and more questions. Who's the they he spoke of? But we hardly have time to ponder that question as we're thrust into a battle. This fight is quite similar to the Bruxa we fought at the start. Nothing entirely special just yet, but still a competent boss fight. Doesn't feel like a regular enemy, but there's the same attack pattern sort of used over and over again. It's hardly a marvel of technicality, but it's still a fun fight nonetheless. After chipping away at the vampire's health, the battle is finally over. to stay where you were. Regenerate. I know you're in trouble. I can help. I'll help myself. No, he's my friend. Yes, Geralt. It's me. Regis? I... You all right? All is well. All's in order. Wounds such as these heal on vampires in moments. But we've not seen one another in ages, my friend. At least in human terms, that is. Regis is a prominent figure in the Witcher books, originally killed by Vilgefortz, but in game canon, seemingly alive and well. Again, we learn more on that later in the story. Slowly, Regis reveals more about the vampire Detlaf. He's not the beast we thought him to be, which certainly complicates matters. The Duchess expects the head of the beast, however, as a friend to Regis, who presents a compelling argument, we can't just kill someone who seemingly has reasons for these killings, but what could justify these actions? Regardless of that, it's clear from what Regis tells us, Detlaf is a good man. Remember the year 964? <sighs> that was three centuries ago. Blind fear gripped Rivia, Lyria, and Spala. Women and children were dying. Their mutilated, dismembered corpses littered the fields. Brute of Lyria. Read about it. Chewed up almost 200, then fell to a common poacher supposedly armed with a dagger blessed by some prophet. It fell to Detlaf, who then found a poacher asleep in the brush near his snares and dropped the fiend's corpse at his feet. And thus, a legend was born. Vampires rarely help humans. Must have had his own agenda, hunting the beast. You err. He slew it for one reason alone. The monster killed a lad who once in the street had offered Detlaf an apple, expecting nothing in return. Terribly noble of him. You do not have a monopoly on altruism, my friend. As well as saving Regis despite not having to do that, spending his time caring for and looking after Regis until he was well enough to venture out on his own. Regis asks us to meet him at the cemetery, leaving us much to think about with regards to the contract. Clearly Detlaf is a good man, but why is he murdering these people and why does he appear to be sending a message? He must have been scorned in some way unless it goes deeper. Many questions, all of which we intend on answering. The way this DLC leaves you always asking more is one of the core reasons I love it so much. The mystery and discovery and the pacing of that, the way they slowly feed you more information, has the player putting the pieces together themselves just around the same time that Geralt is. Which means that while you also have a sense of satisfaction for figuring it out on your own, you also get the sense of satisfaction for the reveals as they hit and confirm your suspicions, yet always leave you needing to know more. The perfect murder mystery. Leaving the warehouse, I took some time to wander the streets of Beauclair at night. It's a gorgeous city, and the architecture is very unique to what we've seen in the Northern Realms. Genuinely one of my favourite locations to visit. I'd love to see future Witcher games visit the more southern areas of this universe. I'm a sucker for well-built up urban spaces in fantasy games. The politics and bureaucracy is just my thing. As I was exploring, a young delivery boy came up to me with a letter. After trying to get some more crowns out of me, I sent him on his way and took a look at the letter. A familiar voice felt welcome in these far-off lands. Dearest. I suspect weighty affairs, rather than merely the wine festival, have drawn you to Toussaint. Perhaps you'll find time to probe a certain matter in spite of this. I recently came across the mention of one Professor Moreau, a scholar in Beauclair, who conducted research into Witcher mutations. Though the details are rather murky, as is the location of the scholar's laboratory, 
His journal could contain more information. It lies buried with him in his tomb. I enclose a map I found in the book I happened upon. Though less than completely legible, I trust it will prove useful nonetheless. I felt this matter could prove of some importance to you. Thus I dispatched this letter without delay. Whatever you decide, please take exceedingly good care of yourself. Your Yen. Hmm. A professor who studied Witcher mutations. Might actually be worth looking into. I didn't look into this for a while, but a really welcome addition to the game. Blood and Wine really adds a lot of elements to the game itself, changing the way you play and also value particular items. At this point, however, I did decide it was time to get to know Beauclair and Tucson. Sure, there was a beast on the loose, but after realising Regis had him at bay, at least for now, it felt like the right time to focus on being a Witcher, helping people and exploring my new home for now. I picked up a few minor contracts, including helping a man discover a thief of a statue's cock and balls. In any other game, this might seem like a really stupid quest, but like I mentioned before, the Witcher handles these silly quests with ease. Geralt thinks this is ridiculous, and the idea that a cock and balls of a statue is valuable to these people is just downright laughable. We help because we want to help these people. We don't buy into their nonsense, but joke at their expense. We're supposed to be laughing at them rather than with them, which is why it works. Riding out of Beauclair into the Tucson countryside, I was awestruck. This game somehow still looks magnificent six years later. Holding up that well in this day and age is tough to pull off. Not many games can do it, but The Witcher does it with ease. The rolling hills, the mountains in the distance, the expansive lake, it's so picturesque. Tucson really is a wonderful place to explore and live. I decided to head straight to the cemetery now though, to catch up with Regis and plot out next steps. Didn't want to keep him waiting too long. Upon arriving, I needed to find a way into his crypt as the door was locked. Classic. I found some caves and traversed those. A few kickamores later and I was with Regis. <laughs> Agreed to meet a vampire at a cemetery. How much more cliche can you get? <laughs> Nothing comes readily to mind. Could have left the door unlatched. What of my privacy? I value it rather deeply. Unmolested, especially by unwanted guests, that's my preferred state. Vampires can evade detection by the senses, and no divination magic works on us. Even the most precise megascope would be useless. And this? Could this help? Wherever did you get that? Off one of the beast's victims, found by a bend in the river. Body was chopped in pieces. Three of those pieces were hands. Hand with the ring seemed the odd one out. Abruxa had taken an interest in it. It's Deadlove's hand, without a doubt. It will do splendidly. It's complicated, so without delving into details, it is possible to use any piece of tissue to reconstruct what a whole body experienced. How's it work? We need any special equipment? We must brew a decoction which Covinaris gave a rather poetic name, Resonance. Once imbibed, it sends one into a trance similar to that induced by narcotics. This triggers visions of events linked to strong emotions experienced by the tissue's owner. Picture it as dreaming a fragment of someone's life. Any chance we might see what Deadlaugh was doing just before he lost his hand? Indeed. Though I also hope Resonance will reveal the location of Detloff's hideout. Covenarius spent half his life proving his theory. Wild guess. Making a dose of Resonance won't be easy. You guess correctly. In addition to Detloff's tissue, we shall need a powerful occipital lobe stimulant. Effectively a poison to make one susceptible to visions. Hmm. <sighs> Well, got a few ingredients to choose from. Unfortunately, all are pretty rare. There's my moon glands, the closest ones I know of are in Vizima. A spotted white saliva would also serve, but they were called to extinction over a century ago. Could go with a kobold's eyes, but the creatures are sentient. I'd rather not gouge one's eyes out. Hmm. Given that we lack the time to sleuth this out ourselves, permit me to summon some help. Was that a raven rather a common sight at this latitude very intelligent fowl i asked him to look for the creatures you mentioned him and his brethren perhaps they'll find one in the area and i would hazard that a flock of ravens will spy any said creature faster than a solitary witcher would with all due respect your skills my friend it will take them some time nonetheless so perhaps you'd care for a snicker of mandrake 
After having our next steps planned out, you can take some time to sit and speak with readers and catch up on what you've missed out on over the past little while. This segment is really nice. It gives insight into Regis' past as well as Geralt's. These two characters have history in a unique way. Both of them see the world from a similar perspective and Regis understands Geralt from a different lens to most. Seeing through his exterior and understanding the man he truly is at heart. Probably the same way only the player understands Geralt. These conversations really are a joy to listen to. After catching up, Regis' messenger bird returns. There is a spotted white in Tucson, and in the state that appears to be covered in spoons. Perhaps there's more to this white than meets the eye, something we'd have to look into. Let's do this. Start making your decoction while I go get some saliva from that white. Uses it in its bruise. Too much in the white will simply sell you some. Worst case scenario, I'll bring you its salivary glands. They ought to do as well. <laughs> For a moment there, I imagined you asking the white to spit into a vial. <laughs> Quite amusing as a thought, but the salivary glands will do fine indeed. So, see you later. Yes, till later. I shall start by perusing some tomes. Tomes? Thought you were going to make this decoction. We require one last ingredient. Alas, obtaining it could prove a trifle toilsome. Thus, I hope to identify a suitable alternative. All right. Good luck. And to you, my friend. Well, with my next large task set, it was time to head out and see to the other tasks around Tucson, to take in the scenery, meet the people, and complete some contracts. Would be wrong of me not to get acclimated to my new surroundings. So I hopped on Roach and left the cemetery in search of new adventures. The very first thing I decided to do was head to the blacksmith in Tucson, to follow the master, master, master quest. I don't know why it's called that. I checked the wiki and I, I couldn't find any reason for it. In speaking with our Grand Master Craftsman, we discover he's been trying to track down diagrams to construct the Grand Master Crafted Witcher gear, a step up from what we had in the end of the base game. And so, of course, I jumped to the chance. I got accustomed to the Viper gear from Hearts of Stone, but I felt it was now time to switch back to our old set and complete the look. So I set out in search of the diagrams for the Grand Master Crafted feline equipment. I have to say, I really did enjoy the hunt itself. It felt like a lot more than just collecting a few items from various locations. I felt like it was a long forgotten story along a trail of breadcrumbs. While on my search, I did come across a contract, a basilisk that had been killing people nearby. However, it was the last female of its kind. A quest that makes you consider what to do next. On the one hand, it's a beast that's been slaughtering people. And on the other hand, it, this, this species is nearly extinct. I couldn't bring myself to kill it in the end. I had to let it go. I hope the dude I met that looked after it could do a better job of not letting it kill people. It was a short and simple quest, but with a message that really packed a punch and I felt entirely invested. Back onto the treasure hunt, however, I felt compelled going from A to B, meeting people, collecting scraps and notes as I went. I even found something I didn't realize existed from my first playthrough, which is the hand spaces. These forts or camps full of bandits are tough as fuck. You're just attacked by hordes of guys and dogs and archers, and you have to work your way through the fort until you reach the boss enemy. In beating him, you liberate the area and the local army can come in and take control. It was really fun and a unique experience in Blood and Wine. In returning with all my diagrams, I realized uh, this was going to cost an arm and a leg to finally craft it all. So it was time to head back out on the path, meeting new people and completing quests and gathering quite a bit of money to be able to afford this Grand Master Witcher gear. And I knew just the place. Hopefully. The Chinfinelli Bank in Beauclair had been holding money in an account in Geralt's name. The perfect place to get some easy coin, I expected. This, of course, begins the Paper Chase quest, an incredible side quest which parodies the process of being in a real-life bank, needing specific documents, being told to go to the wrong places, needing to sign here and there, an absolute nightmare if you've ever dealt with a bank like this before. And a quest that I enjoy thoroughly. It's very clever in its humour, but also switches up the pacing. I do like how city-based quests will always be different from those you find in other areas of the world. It really serves to immerse you in this space. My heart also skipped a beat when this lovely man asked me to play Gwent, and of course, I didn't deny him the opportunity to be absolutely obliterated by yours truly. With the quest finally complete though, and the money finally in my hands, it was 200 gold. I really, I really should have seen that fucking coming. Not nearly enough for the armor to be crafted. I guess back out we go. I felt it was finally time to see our new home in all its glory. 
Corvo Bianco is a wonderful addition to Blood and Wine, allowing Geralt to have a home base, somewhere to store your weapons and armour, a bed to sleep in, and if you know me, that's a big win, and plenty of other decorative features. The estate, however, is in disrepair, the gardens are empty, the house is falling apart, and it's up to us to fix it. Talking to Barnabas Basil, our major domo, and might I add a great Gwent player, we're able to restore the vineyard across the DLC to its former glory. I absolutely love when games allow you to renovate a home base. Honestly, that DLC from Mafia 3 took that game from a solid 2 out of 10 to like a 5 out of 10 in my books. I love home renovation. After the tour of the vineyard, I decided to hop on Roach and head back out. Money was something I needed if I would renovate the vineyard and manage to craft our Grandmaster armor. It seemed quite the quest was ahead of us, but one I was determined to see through. The next quest I sought out was one that I thought was very memorable. A great example of how The Witcher uses side content to make the players feel things and in turn characterize the world, giving it life. Big Game Hunter is a quest where you talk to a Count Belladal, a painter who uses a special invention that he made to capture moments and then later paint them into art. It's essentially the equivalent of taking a photo and then painting that photo, but it's all mystical and magical and pretty cool in this context. We accompany him around the countryside, luring out beasts and protecting the Count so he can capture rare and dangerous animals. Across our travels, we learn he's oddly protected by his men, more so than anyone we've seen. And he also tells us anecdotes of his life, of his daughter, and we get to know this man quite well. Our final task is to find some rare peacocks for him as he wants to paint them for his daughter, who always adores coming with him on these expeditions. Upon returning to the camp, we get this heartwarming moment as we learn the full story. Returning your lord to you, safe and sound. You've our gratitude, master. You see, lads, there was nothing to fear. Thank you, Witcher, for looking after our dear Count. Seems the jaunt did him wonders. Breathed some new life into him. Wait here a moment, Geralt. I have to fetch my coin pouch. Hey, my dudes. New life? He was feeling down? Made no mention, did he? Ten years back, his last Clarice is her name, took a spill off her horse. Been bedridden ever since. Cannot walk of her own. She'd been the life of the house before the calamity. A merry sprite what filled every corner with joy. Count would oft take her out on trips. She loved animals too. Excursions he makes now, or rather, paintings he brings home. There's her only window on the wider world. Sorry to make you wait. Some of your shenanigans proved a little unnerving, yet I still consider the day a success. It's admirable. This man is a true artist. He loves his craft, and also the joy it brings to his daughter who can no longer visit these places herself. It's honestly really moving, and I felt like I became close to who would in another game be an inconsequential side quest killer. But in The Witcher, he became a memorable piece of my experience in Toussaint, and that is truly incredible storytelling and world building. I visited his art exhibition for one final talk, and the man was as genuine as ever, not fitting in with the snobbish art connoisseurs at the event. I felt sad to say goodbye, but it was just time to head back out on the path. No doubt that this quest would change the way I tackled future jobs. I spent some time collecting coin, doing some contracts, competing in the fight tournaments. Your taunts? I've heard dogs wretch things more profound. Hear how pathetic and stupid you sound. Why the fuck am I flighting? Make it stop! But after some time and a lot of work, I finally managed to collect the 20,000 crowns I needed in order to craft the Grandmaster feline set. I felt a huge sense of accomplishment. It feels like ages ago I began crafting the original feline set, and now here we had the one at the very top, the best of the best. A lot of people aren't a fan of the hood, but honestly I kind of like it. Reminds me of that one trailer where he's wearing a hood. Makes sense as a witcher too, hiding his face from people, given the mutations make him look pretty horrific. I did, however, begin to notice something, a large issue, something that would not at all make this journey an easy one. However, I will save that for later on when it needs to be tackled. For now, back on the path. I completed a nice side quest for some ghosts where the reward was some nice old Gwent cards that I could hardly pass up. Then, as we passed the tourney grounds, I decided it was time to switch up their hairstyle. We'd stuck with that one that Vladimir Von Everett gave us all the way back at the wedding in Brunwich. Reverting to our look from the base game felt good, and allowed a sense of artificial progression. You know, sometimes in RPGs you just have to create your own little arcs, and my Geralt's journey had him switch how he does his hair. It means nothing, but I enjoyed it, so. I also, of course, had to challenge the barber to a game of Gwent in which he lost, of course. I then headed back to the turning grounds to pick up a quest that's incredibly involved and also has a great story throughout. The Wobble of a Smitten Knight. 
This quest follows Guillaume, the knight from the start of the game, trying to impress the Lady Vivian. Now he believes she is a victim of a curse, one that we have to investigate, and in order to get closer, we need to take part in the tourney. He can no longer take part in it due to an injury, and so this questline has us racing and fighting and all sorts in a real Fantasy Knights tourney. But the more important part is the curse affecting Vivian. At first, Geralt believes she could actually be a vampire, a Bruxer. However, we soon discover this is not the case. Witcher. Lady Vivian? Counted on me getting lost. I did. I thought you no different from the knights. Good at tourneys, hopeless in the face of true danger. I was mistaken. So you're not actually a Bruxa. A what? Suspicion I had that you might be a vampire. Certain details seemed to confirm it. Then I changed my mind. Anyway, unimportant. Here you come to this clearing often. This is where it all began. And as I was not able to evade you, save myself from you, then I want it done here. In this very spot, with no witnesses. Want what done? Why, you are a witcher. You were hired to kill me, were you not? Then do so, now. And do it quickly, I beg you. I shan't resist. Witchers only hunt monsters, and even then, not all. You're no monster. Then what am I to your eyes? Vivian is cursed to slowly transform into a bird-like creature, a process that seems to have no cure. A line from this quest that stuck with me and sums up Geralt's journey as a witcher is this retort he has when Vivian asks him why she should trust him. Why should I trust you? Because the Duchess trusts me? Because I'm a freak too? Because cases like yours are my bread and butter. Take your pick. Geralt is noble, but not in the conventional sense. In a true sense. He does things for people because it's right, not because he feels he should under some self-righteous sense of morality. And this line seems to convey that incredibly well. The quest closes in a nice way for once. The Witcher stories usually don't, but this one does. Her curse is lifted, and after a risky process, they go off happily. However, I was not happy. Early when I mentioned an issue that would arise from wearing the Grandmaster Feline gear, the weapons have this chime when you reach the threshold for more powerful attacks. By landing heavy strikes, it builds power so that the sword glows and light attacks deal far more damage. The sound to accompany this is a chime. Now, for whatever reason, when wearing the full feline set, this chime never goes away after combat. You end up hearing this constant droning sound that remains until you remove the armor in its entirety and put it back on again. Now this was not something I could deal with, it was beyond annoying, so I needed to find an alternative. There was no way I was going back and gathering all of the Wolf or Ursine sets, it would just take far too long and far too much coin. So I decided the perfect set to replace it would be the Manticore set that was added in Blood and Wine. And so I went off to gather the necessary diagrams and returned to our craftsman in Beauclair. I went through hunting down the diagrams, following each breadcrumb, revealing more of the story behind the armor as I went, which was incredibly interesting too. Finally, the diagrams were mine. Returning to the blacksmith, I could finally craft my set. Thing is, I now needed money. Back onto the path it was, and after a lot of travelling, dealing with people's issues and contracts later, I had all the money I needed. And believe me, this took more time than you would think it took to do. I felt truly like I knew Tucson at this point though. I'd met so many people, those who owned vineyards, people in trouble, knights, nobles, and everyone in between. My quest to gather resources and money had led to so many interesting stories, all that felt unique and organic to my own path. The Witcher has an incredible way of overlapping and interweaving goals, stories, and exploration to feel entirely natural, and in turn, 
so satisfying. The Manticore gear was now mine, and in leaving the blacksmith I felt satisfied with my accomplishments. Before I could return to the main quest, however, there were a few things I needed to do first. Heading to the location spoken of in the letter Yen centers, Professor Moreau was investigating Witcher mutations, and may have discovered a way to advance them, allowing us to have more skills and become more powerful. An addition to the game which was greatly welcome, and by this point, you have your build. I don't need any more skills, but... I would love to do something with all the skill points that I rack up. Heading into the sunken temple, I made my way through the portals and puzzles to find the lab. It's a great quest of mystery and exploration, but also of Moreau's son being taken by the witches and put through the trial of the grasses adds depth to the entire situation. He was actually trying to reverse the mutations, but ended up making them worse, or in our case, better. It was a tragic story, but one that we could use to our advantage. After using the machine, it opens up a new part of the skill tree, allowing us to spend mutagens and skill points together to unlock a new slot for skills, as well as new abilities to use in combat. It's really useful, like I said, being able to spend all the skills you're getting towards this part of the game makes progression still feel useful and enjoyable. With that out of the way, there was one other thing on my mind, something I'd neglected up until this point, the true reason I play The Witcher 3. Gwent. And so I went off to find the Gwent tournament being held in Beauclair by one Count Martin Monnier. However, with this tournament there was a twist. Martin had devised a new deck, a new faction based on Skellige, one him and his brother had planned for a while, his brother sadly passing away. He wanted to make it an official faction in his honour. Rather noble. But in order to take part, I needed to collect enough Skellige cards to make up a deck. And so that was my next goal, heading across to Sun in search of worthy challenges, using my newly found Gwent deck to demolish each and every fucking one of them. I'd miss this. I'd miss this a lot. Going from innkeep to innkeep, from blacksmith to herbalist, each one falling victim to the sheer might of my cards, the power I possessed. I felt like a god. <clears throat> With all the Skellige cards in hand, I headed off to the tournament to play. It was a fun time, playing with a new faction meant learning the new faction. It meant playing in a new way, and it's honestly really well made and balanced. It fits perfectly. There's a minor side arc here about dwarves who don't want change to their tradition with a new faction, but we convince them of it and end happily with drinks. Of course, by the way, I, I won the tournament and got a nice trophy, which I placed on my shelf back home. After a while of travelling, it felt good to be back. I decided it was worth my time to renovate some of the villa. Barnabas Basil worked his magic and finally we had a house to be proud of. Also gave me a place to store my now unwanted feline gear, making the house look a lot more like the home of a witcher. With all those loose ends tied up, I felt it was time to return to my main reason for being in Tucson. To track down the spotted white and finally track down Deadlaugh. Approaching the White's location, you feel an eerie atmosphere take hold. The music shifts, the sky falls dark, and you realise you're no longer in safe territory. Even the countryside of somewhere like Toussaint can be touched by darkness. We encounter bar guests as we ride up the hill, immediately taking me back to the first Witcher game on the outskirts of Bazima. Taking them down, we approach the house where the White is said to be situated. Spoons hanging from all over the rundown estate. This will forever creep me out, it's haunting in the best way. None shall sit and dine with you at your table. No spoon you have shall say to you. Never again shall you wish to spy your reflection in the mirror. Sounds like a curse, all right. Somebody's clearly obsessed. Regis mentioned the place might be cursed. Can't be a coincidence. Need to look around. Learning of the curse, it gives us an idea of what to potentially do, but we need more information first. The house itself is covered in spoons, it seems the White's a collector, but why? Perhaps thinking the right spoon will lift the curse. Reading letters and a diary around the house, we're able to get a window into the last days of this human's life before they became a White. Pretty tragic and heartbreaking. Interesting enough, and honestly even more terrifying if you piece together who potentially cast the curse. In the diary, the final line before the repetition of the letter A is, mirror, lies, no. Followed by a letter in which the woman was seeking help, pretty frantically. 
She makes note of a beggar who came to see her and could be the cause of the curse. All she remembers is that he sold mirrors. Reading that line, I had the impulse to get out of the house. I somehow must have missed those documents on my first run of the DLC when it came out, because that came as a shock. For those who haven't picked up on it, the one who cursed this woman was most likely Gauntra Dim, Master Mirror. It recontextualizes this whole scene entirely. The White was a victim of Gauntra Dim, same as Shakes Lock and same as Olgird, same as us. Now I knew this information, this was a curse I was determined to break, refusing to let anyone remain a victim of Gaunter. Heading through the house, we find the lair of the White, where there is a cauldron. All we needed was some saliva, however, we need to wait for the White to return to brew. Hopping into the wardrobe, we meditate and wait. As the White returns, we watch it, over the pot, brewing. It seems to notice us. Now we can do two things, emerge from our hiding spot and kill the beast, or try and lift the curse. I was already ready to do the latter. gonna hurt you. Wanna help? I've seen the words of the curse on the walls. Think I know how to lift it. to bring folk here, convince them to sit at the table with you, right? Well, I'm gonna be your guest now. Your willing guest. Geralt's resolve is to do the opposite of the words of the curse. None shall sit and dine with you at your table. No spoon you have shall sate you. Never again shall you wish to spy your reflection in the mirror. We have to willingly be a dinner guest, eat without spoons, and force the white to look at their reflection. Doing so transforms the white, but before we can see if our method has worked, the white runs out of the house. Chasing it down, we find an old, decrepit woman. The curse has been lifted. Shh, easy. Not gonna hurt you. Eat. I, I must eat. Safe. Taking her back to Corvo Bianco, she's safe. Talking to her, she seemed incredibly thankful and was also very happy to stay at the vineyard as a cook. She adored cooking in her youth and wants nothing more after having her curse lifted than to cook and eat with others. It's rather wholesome, all things considered. She gets somewhat of a happy ending. I also then decided to talk with Barnabas Basil. I'd somehow garnered enough money and decided to use it to fully renovate the estate, something I never actually did in my original playthrough back in 2016. It felt good to sit out during the sunset and share a bottle of wine, Toussaint wine, with Barnabas. These moments of levity really help after dark and twisted quests like one we just experienced. However, with the white saliva, we can now return to Regis and continue the next leg of our plan. Arriving back at the cemetery, Regis explains the next step and why it's going to be rather complicated. Gonna need much longer to finish brewing resonance? Mentioned the last ingredient, too. What about that? That, I fear, might prove troublesome. You see, to use the concoction to summon the memories of one, the solution must contain the blood of another specimen of the same species. Shouldn't be a problem. I happen to know a higher vampire who should be willing to help. Right, Regis? It's not that simple, I'm afraid. While you were away, I tried my damnedest to identify a replacement, but, alas, none such exists. Not sure I understand what the problem is. Can't we just draw some of your blood? The blood must be in an agitated state. As I'm certain you know, higher vampires can change their corporeal shell. As our flesh changes, so does our blood's chemical composition. To make a long story short, I shall need to induce in myself a state of strong psychokinetic arousal. In brief, madness, rabidity. And that stands to be very, very dangerous. 
Teshamutna is our destination, an old vampire fort. It was used to hold humans as cattle for their blood, as well as housing a special room to hold a famous vampire, Kagmar. A vampire so fierce it was said he could drain an entire village of blood in a single night. It got so bad that it's actually what started the wide-scale hunting of vampires. It wasn't entirely troublesome, as only another higher vampire can kill a higher vampire, but regardless, they decided they had to punish the offenders among them. This special chamber within Teshamutna was used to house Kagmar, a cage he couldn't escape. The room filled with bodies of humans left to slowly bleed out, sending Kagmar insane over the course of 200 years as he lusted for blood. An awful kind of torture for a vampire. Regis, in order to get the necessary extract they needed, planned to subject himself to the same thing, but only for one night. This segment is not only heavy on the lore aspects, but also in the character ones too. We get to see what Regis thinks of the other vampires and about this place and its history. He's not someone who takes well to it. The concept bothers him, but he's also not one to hide from the fact of the matter. Seeing Regis enter the cage and knowing what was about to come is tough as the player. We have to be the one to put Regis through this. Setting the bait, raising the cage into the air, and watching Regis lose his mind in a fit of rage, writhing around, trying to break free, trying to sate his bloodlust. We get the blood sample we need, and then it's time to wait. Wait while our friend is tortured overnight and there's nothing we can do. Need to hang on a little longer. Blood will dry in a few hours. Scent won't bother me. state. Tell me how. I'll help you. Back at the lab, Regis is now able to concoct the necessary brew that will allow us to visit Detloff's memories and ascertain why he's doing what he's doing and where he might be. The queue, sir. But Count, sir, you must understand. I've a meeting. The Count. Sir, you were next. Please, take a seat. This gentleman was here first. Step down or you shall regret it. Ah, <laughs> fails to realize he was your friend, Count. It was then I ordered him to give up his seat and step off the stand. If only you'd seen his face. We got him good, didn't we, Detlav? And then Mother insisted we buy the mill. <laughs> Curious, eh? At least I've a yarn to spin for friends and associates. Forgive me. What?
The information is clear. Detlef became friends with someone he needed to kill. His killing was remorseful, he regretted it. But why did he do it? The question still remains. A location appeared twice in the vision. A boot black stand. Could be the start of an investigation. There was no time to lose. We had to leave the cemetery and find this boot black, somewhere around the docks of Beauclair, and ask him about that love. However, when I say there's no time to lose, what I mean is there was plenty of time to lose, and I decided to fuck off again, do some much needed side questing. The reason I'm bringing this up and not entirely glossing over it and moving on with the story is because it's one of the best Witcher quest there is. Arguably maybe the worst, but I really like it a lot. Equine Phantoms is a quest in which the task is completely irrelevant to what I want to talk about. Basically, this woman has issues with some sort of beast, the phantom, whatever. We, to find it, have to eat some shrooms. Now, I know what you're thinking, this sounds like the start to every single Assassin's Creed Valhalla quest, but sadly, no, we don't meet the White Elk. Ah, the Elk. I am sorry to trouble you, Lord. Roach does, however, start to speak. Wow, this clover's amazing. Now that's what I call a bouquet. Who said that? Oh, you're awake. Had me worried. You were out way too long. Even considered giving you some white honey. Kind of hard to do with hooves, though. What I love about this quest, and those like it, is that it's not the whole game. Geralt acknowledges how ridiculous the situation is. I've talked about this before. There's clear self-awareness here. The game doesn't become a silly game. It's a serious game where a silly thing is happening and everyone is aware that it's a silly thing. Roach also sounds incredibly stupid, and I love it. There's great banter and moments where Geralt is almost speaking for the player, acknowledging Roach's poor controls. It'd be great if you could respond more fluidly to my command. The resolution of the quest isn't really important, but towards the end, I felt sad that the mushrooms would wear off. It felt similar to when the TARDIS has to leave the human body and return to the console in the Doctor's Wife episode from Doctor Who Series 6. Finally, being able to speak with Roach and not being alone felt oddly refreshing, despite it being a joke quest. And when you have to say goodbye and Roach goes back to just whinnying, you feel alone again, even if only for a brief moment. But with our boy, I, I mean girl, Roach restored and the shrooms wearing off, headed back onto the path. I also decided before heading back to the main quest to pick up the legendary sword Arendite. By completing the quest, there can only be one, which demands Geralt displays all five chivalric virtues of the Knights of Tucson. The Lady of the Lake will present to you an incredibly powerful silver sword. It symbolizes Geralt's role as the Sword of Destiny. The weapon is in the first Witcher game, is partially in two, but it's lost early on, and it can be acquired here from the Lady of the Lake in Blood and Wine. It's a very powerful sword and increases in power with each hit you land in succession, which is pretty fucking incredible. And with that secured, it was back to our main focus. Heading to the boot black, it was time to ask some important questions. Geralt's unable to understand the capitalist view this kid is working from. Regis steps in to help out, offering a deal in return for information. The kid tells us where he used to make deliveries for the man, Detlef. We head immediately to the place. We arrived at the Rocking Horse, an old abandoned place that was once a toy store. Sadly, however, it was closed after the owners fell on hard times. Detlef now operates from here. We come upon a room on the second floor, a place where all the clues begin to fall into place. Detlef van der Eretain, you do not know us, but we know you to be a vampire. We know also of your weakness for the wench they call Renoid. Now you know this. We shall chain her down and let rats feed on her. We shall flay the skin from her flesh. Yet you can save her. You need but travel to Beauclair, where you shall slay five men in the manner we prescribe. You must complete the killing in three days. Fail, and the next letter you receive will contain a memento of your failure, your beloved's finger. There you have it. Proof positive Detlove killed not of his own accord. A blackmailer sunk his claws into him. Who's Renowed? His one-time lover. The sole human woman with whom he was very close. Because she accepted him. With her aid and care, he found a place for himself in this hostile world. She began the work that I strive to continue. Never meet her? Never had the pleasure, alas. She deserted him a time before he came round to save me. Though he always claimed she'd gone missing. Even if Renoued did abandon him that time, looks like someone's actually kidnapped her this time. Hard to argue with that. And hard to foresee what he's prepared to do to free her, get her back. He's prepared to kill, that's clear. As would you be for Yennefer, 
He kills, for he cares for her deeply. And that blood, those individuals, they mean nothing to him. Yeah, I get it now. He's out to rescue a female from his pack. Right, so someone's blackmailing him. We know that. Still have no idea who. Need to look around some more. Look, slips of paper, name on each. Count Crespi, Count Dulac, Milton de Peyrac Peyron, Count de la Croix. Detloff's victims, one and all, but that's not his hand. Must have come from whoever wrote the letter, all of it written using the same ink. See the color? Ink was dyed with cinnabarite, rare mineral, pretty much found only in. Nazaire, but I fear it means very little. Anyone could have imported such ink. Fair enough. Still worth remembering. Look, this slip is stained. With wine. Not much to go on either, especially not in Beauclair. Perhaps. Yet perhaps also worth remembering. Let's sum up what we know. Seems Detlaf's being blackmailed. Someone's been feeding him his victims' names. All noted down using one and the same Nazari ink, and not in his handwriting. Not much. But enough to ascertain Detlaf's innocence. Clearly. Actually, it is. Detloff's being manipulated. Some lunatics turned him into a tool, making him kill. So it would seem. So this is far more complicated than we first thought. Detloff is being blackmailed. His lover has been kidnapped, and he's being forced to kill or else his reiner will die. It's clear the puppets hanging from the ceiling are very illustrative of his own situation, being puppeteered around by others. We need to report to the Duchess, see if her or her men can identify more about these blackmail letters. The plot thickens once more, and we're determined to get to the bottom of it. Returning to the Duchess, she expects progress in killing the beast. When we explain the reality of the situation, her reaction is about what you'd expect. Case is more serious than we thought. The beast? I couldn't kill it. Didn't manage. We sent you after a monster, and you return with nothing? We are very disappointed. Situation's not quite that simple. Beast's a powerful vampire. Ha! <laughs> Is this a problem? Is it too much for a witcher? A monster slayer? But everyone knows how to end a vampire. Draw him by trick into sunlight. Or arm yourself with ample garlic and drive a stake through its heart. Garlic's useless against vampires. Sun and stakes don't hurt him either. Those methods? Pure invention. Only work in legends and fables. After some conflict erupts, Anna brings one of her close advisors to identify the wine stain on the letter. Of course, this concept of identifying wine in this manner is utterly ridiculous, but after being set up that Toussaint is all about wine, it's the one thing they have. They're professional wine connoisseurs. In the context of The Witcher, you buy it. Mmm. Mmm, yes. Yes. The, the West Bank of the Saint Latour. No, that, that's rather obvious. Aged in barrels of Beauclair oak. Hue, deep burgundy. Clarity, high. It's simple. Saint Real. The 1269 vintage. That's... That's impossible. The wine is produced at Castel Revello. Especially and exclusively for the ducal table. Perhaps some song real was stolen. We must go to the vineyard, see if there's not been an incident. It's time we were off to Castle Ravello to see exactly how this wine ended up on this piece of paper. Master Fabricio is the man of the estate and the one in charge of making and preparing the Saint Real. He seems to claim everything is fine, that things are going as planned. However, Anna believes he's lying. Going with her, we expect the barrels and lo and behold, we find one is full of not Saint Real, but probably some cheap wine substitute, hoping no one would notice. We confront Fabricio and he explains the reason this happened, allowing us to progress in our investigation. I, I, I admit it. I, I, I sold a barrel of Sorial. I beg you to forgive me. Why did you do it? I couldn't resist. The sum they offered it was enormous. I gave in. Is what I provide not enough? I wished to buy back my family's estate. For here... Nothing is truly mine. I have a roof over my head, ample food to eat, but what is a nobleman without land of his own? Who'd you sell the wine to? 
A few weeks past that, the pheasantry, a rich nobleman approached me. He called himself a diplomat, well-connected at court. He suggested we embark on an enterprise. Some of his clients had offered dizzying sums for even a drop of Sonreal. He was to serve as intermediary. This man's name. He never revealed it. He was tall, black-haired, and spoke with a foreign lilt. He claimed to hail from Sintra. I've no Sintrian aristocrat at court. Wine itself. How'd you hand it over? We met under the cover of darkness in the ruins of Fort Astre. A dozen or so men came to collect. Armed men. The kind that stink of trouble. I had hauled the barrel there. They transferred it to their cart, and we went our separate ways. That's it? That the last you ever saw of them? They... that is to say... A few days passed. A messenger arrived. He said they wished to buy another barrel and... Well, I've prepared it. Have it ready to deliver. Captain, have your men take Master Fabricio to the dungeon. He must answer for his crime. High treason the charge. Whoa, Anna, holy shit. He didn't even do anything that bad. Sure, he sold one barrel of your wine under the table, but like, this dude just wanted his own land. He wanted to make some money and have his own place. Surely you can excuse him that when you have plenty of wine and live in a literal fucking fairy tale palace. Fuck the royals, man. They ain't shit. Justice for Fabricio. Long story short, we head to the place where the trade off is happening. We ambush the bandits and kill them all, which is incredibly violent. And then we interrogate the one remaining bandit. Using our position as a witcher, hunting the beast of Beauclair, we're able to persuade the bandit to give up the information we seek. Who hired you? He... he'll kill me! Ought to be worried about me right now. Who is he? Go on, man! Spit it out! The Sintrian? That is what they call him. I've never seen him, but I know he mustered the man for this caper. That's what they said, that we were working for the Cynthrian. I don't know anything else. I swear it. Captain, we ride to town. Gather your men and seek out the Cynthrian. Someone else must have seen him, must know of him. Yes, Your Grace. I'll report to the palace as soon as I learn anything. I shan't return to the palace. Our mission has not yet ended. The Witcher and I will await you at the guard post near the port. Heading to the guard post near the port to meet with Anna Henrietta, we're able to discuss next steps. How to find the Cintrian. The Cintrian does not work alone. We are fighting an organization, not one man. The port warehouse where the wine was delivered, we identified it, then learned who had hired it out. This proved to be a beggar, a stand-in. We found him. He admitted all. A man had paid him to sign the lease, a man he met while begging outside the pheasantry. There, fate lent us a hand. A waitress recalled spilling wine on a nobleman who spoke with a Cintrian accent. What did he look like? Her description was not helpful. Handsome, well-dressed, with a beard. No distinguishing marks. This could be anyone. But she remembered his female companion very well, as she recognized her. On the Cintrian's arm was Cecilia Bellant. The singer? I've heard of her. She said to be gifted, fairy. The same. We went to her home immediately. Cecilia was not there, but we questioned her servants. A chambermaid claimed Cecilia is to meet a Cintrian gentleman tonight. She'd invited him to a reception mounted by the Mandragora. Gotta nab the Cintrian. Seems we have to go to that get-together. Best go there, blend in with the crowd. Precisely what we shall do. The Mandragora always assembles at the same place. A residence in Oatville. It's a very distinguished district. Geralt, you must don appropriate attire. Then meet me in Oatville, in Mountebank Alley. Knowing our next plan, it's time to prepare for a party. A lavish one, in Beauclair no less. The perfect environment for Geralt of Rivia. I've said this before, but my favourite segments of these games are always Geralt being forced to take part in social events. He's a witcher, not a noble. And so these moments are always incredibly enjoyable to watch, as Geralt is pretty socially inept at least when it comes to interacting with nobility. I have to admit, I thought I was nicely prepared for this party until Anna made fun of my mask and I felt incredibly stupid. And you've even a mask. 
Just not the kind required. <laughs> Once inside, we're able to find Cecilia and hopefully the Centurion. After getting involved in some of the party's activities, we discover Cecilia and the Centurion headed upstairs to the bedrooms for some uh, sweaty uh, game gamer stuff. Uh, however, this didn't go entirely as expected. Entering the room, we find Cecilia dead, her throat cut. Following the clues and the leads, checking over my shoulder to be sure I'm safe, we find ourselves at the edge of the trail. The Centurion was looking for something. A gemstone? But why? Also, the Centurion seemed to have fallen out of the fucking window. Oriana shows up, the one who hosted this party, and reveals some interesting information. So, this is the tracker. A witcher, yes? Indeed, this is him. We found the body together. Then he set off in pursuit of the killer. And ended up here, but I've only found evidence of a fight. Seems the Centrians killed his last, finally failed this time. Shame it happened too late for Cecilia. Poor girl. Always told her she chose her males badly. But I would never have suspected she could arrive with a murderer. I'll alert the staff. Have them see to her body at once. Meanwhile, we should sit. I will tell you everything in full detail. It seems she knows something. More pieces to this ever-growing puzzle. I caught him red-handed, attempting to burgle, rifling through my possessions. What did you do? Summon the guards? Oh, there was no time. I feared he'd escape, refused to give him the chance. He stood with his back to me, so I attacked. He struck his head on a picture frame as we struggled. He was bleeding, dazed, and then he drew a knife. Everything happened very quickly then. I knocked the weapon out of his hand and pushed him hard. He fell out of the window. Just so. Claim the man was trying to rob you when you walked into the room? Yes. He stood over my dressing table, pouring through my jewelry. Mm-hmm. After this is my guess. Picked it up while searching. Why, that's the heart of Toussaint. Oriana, how did you ever come to have it? I bought it, many years ago, from a young woman. The heart is an heirloom. It belonged to my family for years. Then it disappeared. I didn't think we would ever recover it. Seems someone is very determined to find it. The thief left his tool bag behind, found this drawing inside it. Look. The heart of Toussaint. Representation's pretty faithful. Centrian must have been on a job. Got very clear instructions what to look for. So... So it is not him we seek, but his employer. Is this the only evidence we found? Also happened on the weapon he attacked Oriana with. Hunting knife. Used to skin game. Got an emblem on its hilt. This crest is used by the Lords of Duntine. The present master of the castle is a passionate hunter. Our next lead, perhaps. All the pieces seem to come closer together, but there's still the question of what the fuck this organization is doing. Who's in charge if not the Centurion, and how are they connected to the killings? I guess all the pieces don't come together actually, eh? The more interesting part is when Regis and Detlaf show up. The tension in this scene is fucking immense. The way it's written, the way it's structured, you find yourself on the edge of your seat, wondering if any of the characters will slip up. Maybe Anna will accidentally provoke Detlaf. Maybe Detlaf will reveal himself by mistake. It's so well paced and just keeps you entirely engaged. Also, it's not explicitly stated yet, but Ariana is also a higher vampire. Regis kind of points it out with this line. I met her years ago, before I met you and before she settled in Beauclair. We'd not seen one another in... Uh, oh, uh, I can't begin to tell you in how long. But nobody outright says it. It's also weird because in the Night to Remember trailer, she's clearly a Bruxa, and that trailer takes place after one of the Blood and Wine endings. Clearly just something they had to retcon for story reasons, but it still bothers me. For God's sake, that trailer is so cool. But it also makes no sense in the context of the games now, because Geralt wouldn't even be able to conceivably kill Oriana, given that only other higher vampires can kill higher vampires. Unless we're just going to say that Bruxas are higher vampires now, but... Even if that were the case, how would Geralt be able to kill her? Oh, fuck, I don't know, I'm thinking too much into this. Moving on, we also learned of Anna's sister before any of that other stuff that I just talked about. Sorry this is out of order, I don't know why I did it this way, just bear with me. Here's the important scene. 
My sister, Siana, might be among the schemers. She left court when we were children. My parents banished her from the duchy. I've not seen her since. What did your sister do to get banished? Siana was... cursed. Parents run afoul of some mage? No. She was born at an inopportune moment. They said she was touched by the curse of the Black Sun. Geralt, is it true? Can an individual be evil because they were born during the wrong lunar phase? Could be the case. Could also be because they were treated like lepers from birth. Isolated, prodded, ostracized. Couldn't have had it easy, Siana. She... She was angry at the whole world. She felt inferior, felt pain, though she masked this with confidence, arrogance even. She could also be cruel at times. I recall one such situation. She persuaded Cedric the Coolbert that she could see the future in her dreams. We were children, and Cedric's brother was smitten with me. It was an innocent childhood crush. Siana knew of it. She told Cedric of a dream she had had, that he would die at the hands of his own brother. Cedric stole his father's sword and killed his brother. She destroyed two lives with a prank. Cedric mourns to this day. In the end, they forced her to leave the palace. A decade passed. More. I've missed her terribly since. Think your sister might be involved? Why? You see, I recall her always being rather... possessive. Throwing jealous fits if I had something she didn't. Here, yeah, that's normal for sisters. Rivalry. True. I suppose I gave as good as I got. There are times I miss that very much. The wine, its theft was the first clue. That's very much like her. She always did enjoy stealing my toys. But I grew almost certain when I saw the heart of Toussaint. Siana received it from father as a gift. At a time when my parents thought of her as but an ill-behaved little girl, someone wanted some of my wine. The same someone ordered our family jewels stolen, or recovered. It's my sister. It must be. A fallen princess satisfying whims, going after lost luxuries? Hmm. Could be right. I love the lore here about the Curse of the Black Sun and the concept that because of the stigma around the so-called curse, the children with it are often treated as black sheep, which could further perpetuate the curse itself, meaning, is it actually true? Who knows, maybe a bit of both, but the treatment after diagnosis likely makes it worse. Anyway, we now know we need to head to Duntine Castle to free Renna and possibly Anna's sister, Sienna. This complicates things. I decided here as well to have a play around with the outfit dies because I couldn't miss out on something in the DLC. I sort of had to try everything at least once. Sorry, enchanting startup costs a fairy mage room, right? I did indeed forget about you. You'll be forever remembered or, or forgotten. Outfit dies are sick and they also give you a reason to use a lot of your useless collected herbs and items a little bit more often than you usually would. I enjoyed the process of collecting the right herbs to craft this stuff and also the process of getting the die diagrams. Ah, oh, finally got ourselves the white dye. Ah, uh, that's... Oh, yuck. That's... Yeah, that's no good. <laughs> oh, that's way, that's way better. That's so, that's so much better. That's... Yeah. Wow. What a fucking waste of my time. And after that, it was off to Delacroix's mill to meet with Damien and begin the assault on Castle Duntine. I consider this quest somewhat a finale to this section of the game, as things really begin to ramp up afterwards. <laughs> Roderick's horses and we boat. We won't vault far if the boys out front don't hold. 
Not so fast. Little change of plans. Inside the castle, we fight our way through against plenty of guardsmen, even Duntine himself, who sadly doesn't actually understand what's happening, oddly enough. I guess there's more to this that we still don't understand. I knew shouldn't have let them under my roof. Where's the hostage, the woman? What? What, what do you mean? I know nothing about a hostage. Continuing to head through, Regis and Detlaf show up. Perfect timing for some help. It seems, however, things are about to get messy. Slowly you begin piecing things together before you reach the top of the tower. Sienna or Renna have been the one blackmailing Detlaf. Odds are, with the information we know, they're one and the same. The way the information is revealed allows the player to figure it out at the same time that Geralt does. When the reveal hits, it's satisfying in two ways, same as the rest of the game. Not only do you feel vindicated, you feel the shock also because it's paced just right that you haven't had ages to ponder this information right before it's relevant to the story. Now we need only find Anna Henrietta's sister. Where should we look? Do you know? Mm-hmm. Ran into Roderick, Duntine's lord. Told me where I'd find Sienna. Then speak and let's grab her. Time is short. Said she was in a room in the tower. Very one we're in right now, which, incidentally, looks nothing like a prison cell. And just so happens there's a carafe full of wine here. Bet it's still in Saint Real. What's your point? Stop playing dumb. I know everything. Your plan, that this was part of it. Witcher, what is this? Sorry, Dedlaff. You've been had. My friend, please. You must listen to what Geralt has to say. Renna's not her real name. This is Sienna. And Sienna is sister to Anna Henrietta, the Duchess of Toussaint. What? What nonsense is this? Sienna was banished as a child, but it seems she trekked back here recently. Moved into Duntine and ran a Vandergild out of here. Sent a man called the Sintrian to Beauclair to steal some wine for her. Wine reserved for the Ducal family. Sintrian led us to her. Caught him later stealing a jewel Sian had gotten from her father as a child. <clears throat> Sorry, Dedloff. She used you. Part of her plan. to the ground. This, I promise you. You've three days. I shall be waiting. Detloff leaves and we return Sienna back to her sister, hopefully to explain herself. Emotions running high, Detloff soon to destroy Beauclair if unable to meet with Sienna, Anna protecting her long lost sister, and Geralt trying to do the right thing caught up in the middle. Things are more turbulent than ever, and it's up to us to try and fix it. We've discovered Siana blackmailed the vampire, ordered him to kill those men. What? What nonsense is this? She is his missing lover, staged her own abduction to force him to do her bidding. He was a tool. Whole scheme was Siana's. She was behind it. You're mistaken. You must be. This cannot be true. Your Grace, I know this vampire, and- What? You know him? Who is he? Detlaf. The same who so recently sat at my table and told me of Nazaire. Where is he now? Waiting for Siana. If she doesn't show up to meet him by an appointed time, he'll destroy Beauclair. He dares threaten us? Your Grace. We have three days to bring him Siana and... Not a word. You have three days to bring me his head. No more secrets. No more helping vampires. I want what I'm paying for. The head of the beast.
Do you think her grace's nerves have been calmed? Violet rarely forgets, rarely retracts what she says, especially not threats. Yes, well, even I must admit Deadlove's actions were highly inappropriate. Reprehensible, even. Are you upset? Why would I be? Hmm, let's see. You're returning from your hunt empty-handed. No trophy. No new lead to boast of, then pursue. Upset's just not a sensation I feel. Ever. Mutations, remember. Hmm, yes, of course. The excuse you resort to whenever you'd rather not talk about something. Observant of you. So let's change the subject. Opening up, we're a few days later. I open with this scene because I love it. Geralt and Regis just walking and talking. Regis pointing out one of the most important aspects of Geralt's character. We all know it, it's just never outright stated. Geralt explains the mutations mean he doesn't feel particular emotions. Regis retorts that that's merely the excuse he gives whenever he'd rather not talk about something. Geralt's mutations don't affect his emotions. We've always seen that in all of his actions. It's just never been outright stated. Again, this shows us that Regis and Geralt have a very different relationship, one where Regis understands Geralt on a level more personal than most. The setup for this section is that Sienna is waiting somewhere secret for a trial. Anna doesn't want Sienna getting out because having her meet with Detlaf means she could be harmed, which Anna doesn't want. Issue being, if she doesn't meet with Detlaf, he'll attempt to destroy all of Beauclair. <laughs> There it is. The Night of Long Fangs begins as Detloff assaults the city of Beauclair. His vampires come in their droves, slaughtering everyone in the streets. Anna makes plans, we get prepared for a fight, but before we can make a move... Thrust into a fight against Abruxa, the war against the vampires begins. Dodging around the small battle space, avoiding her attacks and retaliating when possible, finally we take down the Bruxa. Afterwards we reflect with Regis on our next plan. Regis suggests two different options. We either find Sienna and bring her to Detlaf, or we find and speak with Oriana to help us find the Unseen Elder, ask him to call Detlaf. Both are options, but have vastly different outcomes. Since these retrospectives follow my own personal journey, we'll do that. I opted to do what Regis advised best, and find Sienna to take her to Detlaf. Fighting our way through the city, we seek Damien, someone we were at odds with for most of the story. Maybe he knows where to find Sienna. Upon finding him, we have a conversation I'm most fond of. Your problem's my problem now. Leave it to me, I'll solve it. How? All I can say just now is I'm gonna need Sienna. You know the Duchess's decision. Sienna awaits her trial, in custody. We know it, but we do not agree with it. You've that luxury. I do not. I've sworn my loyalty to her grace. Folk are dying, many more will because of one. If her grace learns I helped you, my head will roll. And ours will follow right after it. Yet still we are prepared to take the risk. I fear we waste our time here. Come, Geralt. Wait. When... When last I saw Sienna, her grace was escorting her to the palace playroom. Playroom? As in for children? Be sure? I've served in the Ducal Palace for years. I know it's every corner. So yes, I am damn sure. Playroom? So what, Duchess Loxiana up in a dollhouse? Honestly, I've no clue. Look, I've told you what I saw. What you do with it is no concern of mine. Got it. I'll look into it. You get back to your barracks. Retrace my steps. I thought it'd be clear. And you've our gratitude. You helped us a great deal. I helped Beauclair. At least I hope I did. This man who was antagonistic to us and us to him helps us. He's come to understand Geralt and Geralt him. There's a mutual respect that evolves as the story does and it's wonderfully told as a character arc. He gives us the location of Sienna in hopes that it will help the people of Beauclair. And off we go to see if we can't find her. Might I just add that the vibes of this segment are impeccable. The grey sky, the people running in the streets, the immense amount of dead, the terror. You see Beauclair through one lens for 99% of this game. It's idyllic, it's beautiful, it's happy. Were the Night of Long Fangs to happen outside of Crow's Perch, for example, it would almost feel right. This is how Velen is, fucking terrifying, depressing, full of monsters. But in Beauclair, 
It strikes a kind of fear into you that comes from the context of the location that you're in. The juxtaposition between the fairy tale land of Toussaint and the destruction and death wrought by Detlarf is perfection of atmosphere. Arriving at the playroom and making our way inside, we can interact with several things. All things that give us insight into Anna and Sienna's past. Small things here and there, but the big one is the journal. A journal kept by their governess, who looked after the sisters when they were children. There are important pieces of information here. Things to infer from the stories told, their relationship, the issues Sienna faced, their bond, personal things, for use in later dialogue options. However, something I found interesting were the actual stories themselves. It doesn't ever come across like Sienna was a bad person perhaps mistreated, perhaps even troubled herself, but not evil. Anna was treated as better than she was, and Sienna worse. It seems almost as if the parents of these children warped the view these children had of themselves. It's very subtle and the details aren't in your face. It's writing that I can admire. It makes you consider if Sienna was everything you thought she was, and if Anna doesn't have a bit of that too. Especially important considering we would now spend some time with the other sister, in the land of a thousand fables, one of my favourite portions of the game. Expecto ludum. Regis? Regis? Land of a thousand fables. Incredible. Hmm. Let's see where this road takes me. Geralt is transported inside of an enchanted children's book, in which Sienna and Anna used to play in. It's now our mission to find Sienna and get her out so that she can meet with Detlaf, by making our way through the various children's fables in the process. We meet up with Sienna as she's antagonising a witch, similar to the story of Hansel and Gretel, cooking up kids in the woods and such. We're allowed, after defeating the stupid witch in her stupid broom, to talk with Sienna. Here we get to know her some more. She tells us stories about her childhood, about how she was treated, about how she felt, greatly characterising her beyond blatant evil person. Nobody in the story is innocent, and nobody is pure evil either. It's all shades of grey which are explored in depth, giving great value to the narrative and character stories, and works perfectly with the witch's entire premise of choosing the lesser evil. Even more so than the main game. No, greatly more so than the main game. The Land of a Thousand Fables is bloody gorgeous. I mean, look at this shit. How is this game six years old? It's insane to me how well this holds up. And this is on console too. In order to escape, we need to find Jack's three beans to grow a big old beanstalk, just like Jack and the Beanstalk. First thing I did, however, as I am a witcher, is go to the town's notice board to get me a contract. More on that later, though. We spoke first to the girl in the village. Sienna, however, noticed something important. Hey, where'd you get that ribbon? That's mine. Is that so? Then why was it lying in the bushes? Find his keepers, sweetheart. I got it from a Turius Vigo when I was a child. It was to protect me from evil. It clearly didn't work, given how I ended up. But it means a lot to you. How should I put this? I have so few mementos from my childhood, and the ribbon reminds me of the good old days. What if I asked you nicely? Ask me nicely and I might play you for it. A round of cards? And so, of course, I agreed. Any excuse to absolutely ruin someone's day over a game of Gwent is a good day in my book. We won the ribbon, which is more important than words can explain, and we went on with our quest. First off, the nice old contract I picked up, Duck Duck Goose. A goose has been kidnapped by bandits, and it's our job to free the poor fella. I killed the bandits and freed the goose. He gave me a nice reward. Thankfully, we got ourselves a nice golden egg. On to finding the beans, though. We got the first one from the three pigs' houses. Then the second from a certain wolf, who no longer has his red riding hood or hunter. But more importantly, this quest allows us to see Sienna in another light. A light which, annoyingly, she does point out herself blatantly in her own dialogue. Inference is sometimes more valuable than the characters just pointing out the things that we're supposed to infer, but regardless, it's the nice mirroring of her situation that we see here. Hmm. Wolf's pretty cranky. 
Surprised? Think about it. He was cast in the role of the nemesis without ever asking for it. It's a doc's life, I tell you. We do the game of Red Riding Hood and get ourselves the second beam. Now to head to Rapunzel's Tower, Kingdom Hearts style, and grab ourselves the final one. This section always freaks me out. I don't know, I just find hanging corpses fucking terrifying. With the Wraith defeated, we have ourselves the third and final beam. Time to plant them and return to the real world. Something's always gonna go wrong. The home stretch. Fighting the Cloud Giant is a fun fight, albeit not very hard, but regardless it's a nice time given the context. Finally taking it down, you're able to progress and leave this fairy tale world. However, Sienna does want something beforehand. Wait, that's not what I meant. I need you for something far simpler and far more pleasant. Well, don't just stand there and stare. I need a man, Geralt, and I'm not afraid to say it. I have no idea what awaits me once we leave this place. Treat it as my last wish. And of course I denied her. I'm loyal to Yennefer and Yennefer only. Except for Kira Metz that one time, but we don't talk about that. Heading through the castle, you do come across this little wispy fella. Following him, you actually get this neat little Dark Souls easter egg. Like the bonfire and you get this cool little animation. I really like this. Jumping into the well, we finally leave the fairy tale land and return to Beauclair. in a fountain? Not terribly practical. It was a secret passage. Anarieta and I would use it to... Hide from your governess. Which luckily she noted down in her diary. Thus I knew where to await you. Never mind that. Has the young lady agreed to help clean up the mess she's made? She has. And stop treating me as if I were a child. Would you prefer I treated you like the lying manipulator you are? Holy shit, Regis, fucking hell. He's right, though. Heading to Tesha Mutna, though, we await Detlock's arrival. Not that simple. I. Oh no. It's very simple. You either deceived me or not. In forgiving you, I grieve. For now, we must part. What? But how? See, I told you that ribbon was important. She'd be dead now if not for Gwent. The ribbon? Ha! Seems I've been fooled again. She will pay for this sooner or later! She will pay! You never should have meddled with her!
We're now thrust into the final boss fight, a one-on-one. -on -one. Detlef is beyond saving, he needs to be stopped. This boss works in three phases and is easily the best boss in the entire game, Eredin is absolute child's play compared to this bad boy. The first phase is pretty simple, it's the same as the warehouse fight from the start of the game. You dodge his attacks and then land one after, a dance around him, taking shots when possible. After this however, is when he brings out the big guns. Detlef transforms into his flying form. Here it's all about patience, he'll swoop to get at you. Dodging out of the way allows you to avoid his attacks. He'll hover and summon bats to swarm. Dodging away again avoids these. He will occasionally ground pound, at which point you have to make sure to avoid the initial impact of the attack. However, after that, moving close as this is when he's vulnerable from attack. Land as many hits as possible, usually about three or four, and then dodge away to avoid his retaliation. Memorize the patterns, heal up and avoid his attacks, and that takes you to his final form, easily the hardest. This stage is an illusion inside of Detlef. There are a few pulsing hearts around the walls of this arena. The only way to beat him is to take these out. Issue being, he creates these oozing replicas of himself to fend you off and will continue to do so. Focusing all your attention on the heart is the only way to beat him, and so it's all about avoiding the attacks of his copies whilst fully focusing on the areas where you can actually do damage. Upon destroying all three hearts, Detlef finally falls, defeated. The end of this battle is tough, it's emotional. This fight has true weights and true stakes. Detlef is beaten, but at what cost? He was emotional. He was in a way, innocent. He couldn't go on doing what he was doing, but who's the real monster in this story? It's too complex to say for sure. All that's certain is that I definitely shed a tear as Geralt walked away, leaving Regis to finish the job. a smashing ensemble. You wear it well. Shut up. I look like a twit. The caftan is sewn of the best fabrics available, and according to the best tailoring practices. But one must have a modicum of taste to appreciate this. Even the most exquisite robes cover only deficiencies in beauty, never in refinement. It's been two weeks since the death of Detlef. Geralt's preparing for a ceremony at the palace. Regis, however, presents an interesting piece of the puzzle. All is seemingly forgiven. Sienna is in the castle, but who was the fifth victim going to be? What was Sienna's end goal? It seems every killing had a motive. 
and it might be good to find out. This quest is entirely optional. You don't have to do this, you can ignore it and go on with the ceremony. But this quest, like plenty of optional things we've done thus far, solidifies what many consider to be the true ending, or the best ending of the game, myself included. Of course, all the endings are viable and work by the way you interacted with the story, but after all I'd done, there was no way I could leave the mystery unsolved. I feel this is where everything comes together in the best way, to conclude the mystery we've been following for the past 30 hours. Heading back to the boot black, we learn through Regis that he's the one who sent the letters, and is the perfect person to ask about the fifth one. After some haggling, he tells us to visit a homeless shelter. Seems Sianna used the homeless of Beauclair to do her bidding. After a tussle there and a problem to solve, we finally obtain the fifth and final letter, with the victim's name on it. Damn it. What is it? Another name, truly? See for yourself. Well, well. I... I must say, even I did not expect this. This time, you will see to our Duquesa. It seems we underestimated Siana rather grossly. Judging by this, Detloff was literally supposed to tear her heart out. Yet first you must snap her neck. Puzzling. Puzzle complete now. Alas, the matter has ceased to be a tantalizing brain tease and has turned incredibly grave. We've proof of a plot to assassinate Toussaint's ruler. We've proof of a coup d'etat. Duchess was to be Detloff's last victim. Sianna planned it from the start. Indeed. The logical conclusion, Geralt. Four seemingly random victims to start. The virtue's their only link. Enough to get folk talking about a righteous, vengeful beast. Obscured the victim's links to Siana, even as she had those she despised killed off one by one, leaving the Duchess for last. Had she managed to fulfill her plan, none would have questioned the reasons. Most would have thought Anna Henrietta had died for her sins. She was known to show a hard heart on many occasions, ample proof of a lack of compassion. Why would Siana murder her own sister? Out of envy? To take power? from an inborn penchant for evil? Yes, yes, and yes. All seem likely, and none are mutually exclusive. But if you'd like to know for certain, you could always ask her yourself. Sylvia Anna planned to kill the Duchess herself. It stands to reason that she wouldn't have let this feud die, and that she still plans to carry out the murder. All that remains for us to do is speak with Sienna and see if we can't convince her otherwise. This is where the stories that we learned in the Governess's Journal and in the Land of a Thousand Fables come into play. By choosing the right options that play into Sienna's true motives and emotions, we can talk her down, convince her not to kill her sister. Although tension is still high right until the very end because unless you're using a guide, which I always refuse to do, you can never be sure that you made the exact right choices. Heading to the ceremony, we talk to Damien and inform him of the situation. He gets more guards posted just in case, and then it begins. Geralt is gifted an award for slaying the beast as much as it pains us to admit it had to be done, as well as our reward of 5,000 crowns. Wait, seriously? I played 30 hours, a whole long quest line, and the literal duchess of this land can give me only 5,000 cra- Not gonna lie, that seems a little bit small. The important part of this ceremony, however, is the climactic final resolution to Sylvia Anna and Anna Henrietta's relationship as sisters. Did we do enough to talk her down? Will she still hold a grudge? How will everything end? I'm sorry, dear sister. Can you forgive me? This ending is bittersweet. Sure, the sisters find peace, but we lost countless in the process. The cruelty that was shown to Sienna in her childhood forced her into a life that caused her to use people and rip apart lives. It's impossible to say where the evil started, who's truly at fault, and how it could have been avoided. 
It's a story full of moral dilemmas and shades of grey, and I love it for that. All in all, best part of the whole ceremony, it was short. Perhaps for you, as you ducked out early, the others are probably just getting started. The drunkenness never ends in this quaint realm. Not so fond of Toussaint after all, are we? Oh, this place is like a strong wine, Geralt. Good in small sips. After all is said and done, we sit on the outskirts of the city in the cemetery with our pal Regis, reflecting on what had happened and where we've come. A wonderful moment of deep introspection and conclusion. After everything we've been through, this moment of pure levity is nice. Desirable. They gather the necessary resources to make more of Regis' special brew, fighting off a Bruxa in the process. The vampires seem to blame Regis for Detlath's death, believe him to be a traitor, which leads Regis to conclude he has to go far away, leave Toussaint and find somewhere else to call home. Sitting back around the camp, Geralt and Regis say their final goodbyes to one another, talk of their plans moving forward. After everything Geralt has been through, in all three games in this trilogy, through the DLC and finally in the end of Blood and Wine, this conclusion of Geralt's story thus far in the Witcher universe is beyond satisfying. <sighs> I so don't feel like going anywhere. Sit here a while longer? So we shall, my friend. We have witnessed, and in fact on several occasions incited, many great and weighty events. After all that toil, I believe we deserve a bit of a rest. That we do. In the fields of Toussaint, alone, after Regis has departed, Geralt hops on Roach and heads back home, to Corvo Bianco. This ride home over the calm countryside of Toussaint feels conclusive. The music, the wind, the people, everything feels right. Finally, we can relax and be at ease. Arriving at our vineyard, we find someone who has arrived and is refusing to leave. Unexpected as ever. And beautiful as ever. Won't you even ask why I've come? Or how I found you? Wouldn't get a straight answer anyway. Quite true. Used to bother me all your secrets. Now I know if you have something to tell me, you'll tell me. Don't need to ask. I missed you, Geralt. Madly. Come outside. We can hold hands and stare at the sky, like some shitty two-crown romance. Yennefer of Vengerberg. Obviously, your choices in the main game depend on who arrives here. It can be Yen, Triss, Ciri, or Dandelion. Yen, of course, however, fits with my playthrough, given she's the one that we found ourselves closest to, and the fact she's here to stay with us felt right. Made Corvo Bianco finally feel like home. Sitting and speaking with Yen is a great way to conclude such a turbulent expan- Oh, for fuck's sake. Sitting in our vineyard, staring out at the sun with Yennefer is the ending that makes sense for our Geralt. Everything is tied up. Everything is over, and so concludes our time in Tucson, the land of blood and wine. Blood and Wine is an expansion for me that transcends the meaning of expansion. Not only does it ooze with content, it's unique and huge and full of depth. Blood and Wine is DLC like we've never seen it and probably won't see for quite some time. The Land of Tucson is its own character. Different from the fields of Velen, the fjords of Skellige, or the streets of Novigrad, the politics is taken in a new direction, and the general populace too. The many new armors, weapons, abilities, and minigames allow for this DLC to feel like a true expansion of the base game in the 
way it handles all of its elements. It doesn't just add new story missions, it expands the way you interact with the world and play the game. The story and characters are some of the best in the franchise, and the narrative force behind everything you do never fails to have enormous weight. You feel swept up in a story of death, betrayal, murder, and mystery, all with the themes of The Witcher at the forefront. Geralt continues to have growth, and his relationship with Regis is a highlight. The moral dilemma of Detloff and Sienna has you questioning your own actions and those of everyone around you. This expansion will never not be incredible. It's memorable for all of the right reasons and stands as a shining example of what a conclusive and expansive RPG DLC package could be. Despite the insane depth and amount of content, it always leaves me wanting more, which is why for me, this will always be the king of DLC. This video was sponsored by the online learning community, Skillshare. Skillshare offers classes on a bunch of different things. A lot of people have been loving going in and finding new ways to spend their time, and that's great to see as well as supporting the channel with that free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. It's super affordable at under $10 a month after that free trial, and you're getting access to a ton of classes on things you might want to learn. You never know the potential career paths learning these skills could open for you. I've been using a few classes to try and perfect my skills with After Effects, something you see me use in a lot of my videos. Also, don't forget the deal is still available to you. The first 1,000 people take the link down in the description and get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. It's worth checking out even if you don't think it's something you'd necessarily be interested in because even just by signing up for the free trial, it helps support me and also gets you access to a world of creativity you might not have thought about before. As always, if you do check it out with my link and decide to learn a new skill, tweet the results at me or hit me up on Discord. I'd love to see what you've all been learning how to do using Skillshare. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. That concludes our trilogy of Witcher videos for the five-year anniversary of the main game, Hearts of Stone, and now Blood and Wine. It's crazy to think that a year ago, over a year ago, is when I started working on my video for the base game. It's really come around very quickly, and I've really enjoyed revisiting The Witcher, analyzing this game, going through it all in videos. It's been a ton of fun to really put this series of videos together, and I thank you guys for tuning into these as well. It, it really means the world to me. I've been doing a lot of streaming recently over on Twitch as well. If you want to go follow me over there, I'd really appreciate it. I'm trying to do a lot more uh, with streaming as well as condensing those streams and content from streams and more low effort videos over on my channel, It's Lazboy. If you want to subscribe over there, you can do. The link is down in the description. I post sort of anything I feel like posting. It's a lot more of a casual, low effort channel, whereas this channel here is for all of my best content. And if you enjoy that type of content, head over to my channel here. Have a look and see what other videos you might take a fancy to. There's a ton on here that I work really hard on, very long form, in-depth, high quality videos. One that I'm really proud of is my Subnautica video where I analyze how it felt for me to play, having a bunch of fears of the ocean. That was a really good one to put together. I've got a few other plans in the future for retrospectives, including the Saints Row franchise, as there's a new one they're working on, soon to be announced, hopefully. And also Sleeping Dogs. I really want to replay that game and do a video talking about it because I've not played it since it came out and that was quite a while ago. If you have any recommendations for videos you'd like to see me tackle, then go ahead and leave it in the comment section down below. I'm up for really doing anything. I plan on doing ones for The Witcher 1 and The Witcher 2 at some point. Probably not soon as I'd like to take a break from The Witcher for the time being, but I, I probably will do it down the line. Anyway, with that said, thank you guys so much for joining me and I will see you all very, very soon for plenty of other bits and bobs. Love you all. Catch you later. Bye-bye.